This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. It's one of the most preserved, intact brick forts in the United States. Used to defend the waters of Pensacola Bay, it sits high on a hill, providing a view that can see enemy ships approaching from the south. Its construction took five years and six million bricks to complete. It's Fort Barrancas, and if you ever find yourself on Naval Air Station Pensacola, you'll discover it right in your own backyard. was constructed in the late 1830s. It was part of a system of forts built to protect the East and Gulf coasts from attack after the War of 1812. We're at a ranger station at the fort's entrance, and we're about to be shown what makes Fort Barrancas so special. Let's go. Hi, I'm Ranger Jeff Massey. I'm the uh, primary uh, park guide, park ranger for Fort Barrancas and the Fort Barrancas area, Gulf Islands National Seashore. Today we're uh, here on the glacier of Fort Barrancas. Uh, fort Barrancas is a third system fort. It was one of the 42 that were built uh, from the period of about 1820 until 1870. Uh, fort Barrancas was built uh, particularly from 1839 until 1844. It took five years of construction. Uh, it was built with approximately six million bricks and was uh, completed with the labor, uh, slave labor, about 58 slaves that were employed here under a contract uh, through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The superintending, uh, superintendent was a man named uh, Major William Henry Chase. Major Chase came here, uh, started from uh, Fort Pickens in 1832, and then he completed Fort McRae, and then he, uh, his final piece was here at Fort Barrancas in 1844. Fort Barrancas kind of has this artistic quality, and I, I like to believe that it was kind of his legacy. I think he knew, he had a sense of purpose that this was bigger than him, uh, that the fort was gonna outlast him. Uh, and I think he really took a lot of care and diligence in the construction of the fort. We can actually see some artistic work. Uh, he had an incredible record with Congress of documentation uh, from nail, brick, um, all the materials that were required to build the fort, um, even down to the labor rates for the slaves that were here. Um, what you're looking at here is the glacier. This is the, the first part of the defense of the fort. Um, we'll talk some technical terms, um, and then we'll go inside the fort. 1835, uh, Fort Pickens was completed. They started Fort uh, McRae on Perdido Key. And then the last piece of the strategy to protect the harbor of Pensacola was Fort Barrancas. Fort Barrancas doesn't have casemated cannon. Fort Barrancas has what they call barbette. They took uh, 12 uh, 24-pound cannon, they placed them on top of the parapets of the fort, and their job was to shoot cannon projectiles into the water should a ship try to force its way or ships try to force their way into Pensacola Bay. She didn't have the ability to protect herself from land and that's why we're seeing this glacier here. It's kind of hard to imagine but there's actually a fortification on the other side of this berm. This berm is artificial. This berm is about 16,000 tons of sand and dirt that was brought in and packed to create this 40 degree slope. It does a couple of things. It protects the fort behind it, but also creates a gravitational barrier to soldiers that are going to have to try to take this fort by force. As you walk up it, you're going to get a sense of being winded. Uh, imagine being a soldier in the attack, trying to go up this, wearing um, between 40 and 60 pounds of gear, uh, malnourished, marching here for about five or six miles to get into a combat formation, and then trying to assault this fort. He's got to deal with gravity. He's got to deal with the defenders shooting down at him. And if he does get into the fort, there's a whole bunch of nasty surprises waiting for him, and we'll discuss those. Walking up this glacier is challenging. You can imagine how hard it must have been to charge a hill like this, weighted down with gear, and all the while thinking about what was waiting for you on the other side. From the period of uh, 1844 to 1861, this was a federal installation. It was a United States Army artillery post. You had about 200 soldiers that would have been based here. The men weren't encamped in the fort. They were encamped at Camp Barrancas, which is down that area there, approximately 400 yards uh, to the northeast. The men would have been only assigned here for duty, for artillery uh, fire practice or when they had a type of drill. There would have been six men, eight men assigned as the guard. They would have been permanently on post. In a rotational period, they would have slept in the fort um, and they also would have provided the sentry duty in guarding the fort. If an attack was imminent, they would fire their muskets, um, sending the alarm, the drawbridge would be raised and they would be able to defend the fort. From a period of 1861, January, uh, Florida becomes the third state to succeed from the Union when they do. 
uh, there's a call out from all the state militias demanding that the federal forts be turned over to those states. Uh, there was a young man here named Lieutenant Adam Slemmer, and Slemmer had a choice to make. He had 51 soldiers left out of the company of 200 that were loyal. Most of them were from the north. He was from Pennsylvania himself. And he had to make a decision tactically, how do I protect the forts? And then strategically, how do I protect my, uh, the primary responsibility of the harbor fortifications of Pensacola? So Lieutenant Slemmer takes his company of men, 51 soldiers and 30 sailors from the naval base, and he locks himself up into Fort Pickens. The next morning, the Alabama militia company of Florida state troops come here and they take over the fort. And then very quickly, this turns into an armed encampment and it goes from zero soldiers to 8,000 Confederates in a period of about three months under General Braxton Bragg. The fort at Fort McRae and Fort Barrancas were decidedly Confederate during that time frame, and they resided here for about 18 months until May of 1862 when they abandoned Pensacola. Uh, they go to Corinth, Mississippi because the enlistments were running out on these soldiers and they remuster, and uh, they end up going and fighting in the Battle of Shiloh. And most of those men that were drilled here uh, with a pretty intense drill period of 18 months, um, they took the most casualties at Shiloh, and historians can attribute that probably to the sheer amount of drill and discipline that were instilled in these men while they were here. So after uh, May of 1862, the Federals come back over and they reoccupy Fort Barrancas. This stays as a U.S. Army post until 1947. Um, I'm told personally by folks that have seen a lot of the third system forts that this is probably in the top four or five uh, of the best that are uh, restoration or the best preserved. So as we go into it, we're going to see some, not only just a, a thing of beauty and a natural fortification, but you're going to be able to kind of see uh, the strokes of history, particularly what Major Chase did and then the slaves that built the fort. During peacetime, the cost to maintain brick and mortar forts was minimal. Now, prior to constructing Barrancas, Major Chase built Fort Pickens and Fort McCree across the bay. And in the process, he developed great experience and a skilled labor force. Another note, he did not have a computer or drafting software to help him build this wonderful structure. He built it primarily with plumb lines, protractors, and survey shots. From here you can really get a sense, actually a really good scope of the strategy and the tactics of why the third system forts were built. Back when we started off as a nation, we had two choices. We could have built large amounts of wooden vessels. Problem with that is uh, just the sheer manpower required to maintain a floating navy to be able to protect all the tributaries and harbors and fortifications along our coast would have been enormous. Uh, you would have deforested all of our trees trying to build the ships. Um, so they went with the masonry forts. And what's really good about a masonry fort is during time of war, they're manned. During times of peace, they're not manned, so they present no threat to the public. They can be um, put in a caretaker status, uh, a reserve status, and no manpower is required to maintain them. Fort Pickens is on Santa Rosa Island. It's approximately a mile and three quarter by cannon. The harbor entrance right there would have been bracketed by Fort McRae, which is no longer here. And then Fort Barrancas' responsibility was to be an anchor shot, and the intent would be to get three shots into that area there for any ship that was trying to make the reach into Pensacola Bay. To point out here, there's a little, little fortification right there. It's white. That is the Spanish battery, Battery de San Antonio. It was a, a Spanish media luna. It's called a media luna because it's a half moon. That was built to protect the Spanish settlement here in the 1790s. What occurred was when we got this as a colony or territory in 1820, uh, this was incorporated into the design of Fort Barrancas. And what they did is they actually placed the heavier artillery down below uh, with the intent of trying to skip cannonball shot across the water and into the holes of ships. And then they had the lighter batteries of 24-pounders uh, up on top. Fort Pickens, 21 and a half million bricks. Uh, Fort McRae was about 7 million bricks. And then you have Fort Barrancas, which is 6 million bricks. So you could see a, an economy of scale, and as they got, by the time they get to Fort Barrancas, most of the bricks were produced locally. Um, the brickworks would have been from Gonzales, uh, the Bonifay family, uh, and they also would have been uh, predominantly lo uh, built locally, would have been shipped in by barge, and then they would have been trucked up by uh, ox carts or mules on a, on a small mule-driven railroad uh, to, be, to be used for the construction of the fort. It's unique the fact that uh, Pensacola had four forts. The only other area in the United States that had more per capita brick forts was New York. And I think we can agree why. It was a, a, a large city, a large metropolitan area, had a lot of population, was the center of trade and government. But then you look at Little Pensacola and the fact that our government decided that we should have four forts um, speaks to the, the strategic value of this deep water port. 
it's kind of odd when you look out there now and you see the beauty of Perdido Key and the, the brick fort out there, seven million brick fort, no longer there. Um, pretty amazing. And then you look at this one that's here with six million and you can look at it and go, it stood the test of time. That just shows you the sheer firepower and the will when two forces go at it. Our forts were designed to protect against foreign power and ironically enough, the only time they were ever used in, was against other Americans. Now as we enter the fort, you can really get a scope of the strategic ability, you have the high ground here. The trees were gone, so the area you could see for, for miles in the range of it. So to be able to defend it and have this kind of high ground on a promontory like this was very, very beneficial. And you can see as you look up above it, you can really get a sense of the height of a defender and the ability to be able to project and defend this area. There would have been a picket here. The picket's responsibility would have been to challenge any invader. Um, or an intruder. They would have asked a pro word or challenged, advanced, be recognized. If they couldn't provide the proper uh, response, then they would have been engaged. Uh, the picket would fire a shot. And the two men inside the fort's responsibility then would be to immediately raise the drawbridge. An obvious question to this kind of encounter is, what happens to the picket? Well, the answer's not so rosy. After the initial engagement and shots are fired, if the picket can make it across the drawbridge before it's raised, well, then he's safe. If he cannot, he is initially on his own to engage the enemy. It's an unfortunate situation, but it speaks to the sacrifice that soldiers were willing to make at the cost of protecting the fort. As the drawbridge would be raised, um, a couple other things would occur. Uh, the men would be able to close these double doors. The double doors would be locked and braced. And now you have the uh, additional problem of not just climbing over the drawbridge, but you have to be able to penetrate the doors. Um, it could be assumed that the men would be in here with cohorn, small howitzers, uh, certainly with muskets and rifles, and they would be ready to engage anyone that tries to breach these doors. Um, and that would allow enough time for an attacker who is still making his way in. Um, he's still got to meet this defense, and then the defenders can maybe rally support from the local camp to be able to come up and attack it. Um, there's a sense that the European powers were very fearful of our forts. They understood that to do so, they'd have to bring a lot of men. Um, you can figure that uh, they would have to signal their intent to come by Navy and by then we would be able to build our defenses up. And I think in that way they served as a very big deterrent, probably at least as possible or capable as the nuclear deterrent in the modern Cold War. Um, they had these same deterrents back in the age of colonialism. Uh, they were never attacked by Spain, England, or France. So once the United States built these brick forts, uh, invested heavily in them, um, it really established American dominion and dominance as a, as a rising world power. Okay, as we enter in here, this is the guard shack and it's co-located with a powder magazine. This powder magazine, um, it's not located near a howitzer position, but it is located, there's two of them, they're located at the rear of the fort. And that was because they were expecting a naval action and an attack from naval vessels from the, the harbor. So they didn't want to have their powder magazines up close to where the cannon would be. This area would have been about six men assigned for the guard. There would have been a wooden roof. Uh, there would have been wooden bunks in here as well. And the intent would be for those men to maintain a, um, a continual presence of alert to be able to raise that drawbridge. Um, the powder magazine next door, uh, it's unique in the fact that it still has the original wood on the wooden ceiling up above it. It's unique also in the respect that it has brass and copper fittings. Um, that's important because you don't want to have an ability for spark or anyone to contaminate the area in an embardment or any type of a military action where you have artillery, you have to imagine that the powder wouldn't just be in there, it would be hanging heavily in the air. You don't want to cause a spark or any type of um, uh, uh, conflagration by having any type of material that would be um, conducted to a spark. An example would be um, the boots of the men, the soldiers at the time, they would have been roughly cobbled with nails. And if they were to walk in here across this brick floor and even hit their foot across it, it could cause a spark. The man that would have been locked inside that powder magazine would have had um, some type of long pajamas, probably stocking feet. Uh, he would have been devoid of any type of metal, a belt buckle, or any type of a weapon. And his job would have been to dole out that powder to the cannoneers, which would have been up on the parade ground. But this is very unique in the fact that you have a, a, a close to original powder magazine that dates back to 1844. You can really get a sense of the beauty of this fort, the amber bricks, the lighting of it, the texture, um, from the chisel marks from the slaves that built it. And the fact that even today the joinery, this is non-restored, this joinery is original, will still cut your hands. Just imagine what the inside of your hand would look like handling this brick 12 hours a day. The calluses would have been immense. Um, the calluses would have had calluses. 
But these men did it, they got up every day, and they continued to do something where they took great pride in. Um, and I think that's a testament to the value that it still stands today. It's done in arches, everything is an arch work. Um, and as we see over on this side of it, just like at the advanced readout, uh, you really get a better sense of the interior walls being built first, the exterior walls were built secondary, and allowing that gap in there to keep the, uh, the tension down from a 90 degree joint to allow the fort to settle over time. Um, it's a testament that 170 years later, it's still here. Um, the walls have not collapsed even during combat. The view from atop Fort Barrancas is just beautiful. You can see for miles in most directions. Now to the south is Fort Pickens, and across Pensacola Pass is where Fort McCree used to stand. It's the positioning of these three forts that shows how difficult it would have been for an enemy ship to sail through these waters under cannon fire. So here's the parade ground of Fort Barrancas. This would have been the area where, similar to the advanced readout, this is where the officer of the day um, when they were doing artillery drill during the Confederate occupation, this is where the, the chief gunner or the officer of the day would have been given gun assignments um, on the uh, off chance that the Federals would attack. Well, they did attack. In November of 1861, the Federals had reinforced Fort Pickens. Colonel Brown, who was in charge at the time, wanted to avenge an earlier Confederate attack by bombing Fort McRee with Navy ships and Fort Barrancas with Pickens cannons. So over a period of two days, professional artillerymen fired 5,000 cannon shots toward Fort Barrancas, while militia soldiers from here responded with 1,000 shots of their own toward Pickens. A lot of firepower. Yet it resulted in the deaths of only two Confederates and three Federal soldiers. Why so few? Well, because these forts were designed to engage ships in the bay, and the forts themselves were out of the range of each other's cannons. As you increase that range and try to expand your artillery capability and your range, you're actually reducing the capability of the cannon. So that could account for the fact that the, the uh, the charges were not explosive because they didn't have the fuses to make it that far. And by the time the cannon got there, the soldiers in their after action reports actually talk about how they can see the cannonball coming. They could actually step aside and the ball would roll harmlessly past them because it had lost all of its velocity at that point. But one thing that's important during an artillery duel, these forts were designed to stop ships. And the irony of history is Fort McRae was destroyed by ships because two U.S. Navy ships, the Richmond and the Niagara, closed upside the port of the fort walls. They were able to hit it with a uh, Parrot cannon fire, which was a rifled cannon, and they were able to, in that instant, make the brick masonry forts obsolete. Now from this vantage point, you can really get a, a, a better sense of what it would have been like in that artillery duel between the two forts. Um, Pensacola has that history. We can say that um, not only did we have the War of 1812 action with Andrew Jackson taking that white fort right there in 1814, again in 1818, but then we had an actual artillery duel between federal forces and Confederates that were in occupation of the fort. The lighthouse coincidentally was, was present during the Civil War and it was hit approximately four to six times, depending on who you can re believe on the after action reports, uh, by the Federals over at Fort Pickens. And they were trying to hit that lighthouse for a purpose. It was to knock the fort, or they, were, they believed that the Confederates were using it as an observation point, so they wanted to knock that lighthouse down to prevent the Confederates from doing so. But you could really argue that they really didn't need the lighthouse because from this position, they could see everything that would have been going on at Fort Pickens. What is also hard to imagine is it wouldn't just been Fort Pickens. There actually would have been naval blockading ships that would have been present all over the area back there in the Gulf of Mexico because the U.S. Navy used Fort Pickens as a springboard to do blockading actions against the Confederates here on the Gulf Coast and then eventually to take New Orleans. But people always ask, what happened to the cannon at Fort Barrancas? And it's a fair question. We have a cannon, it's a 24 pounder. It's, a, it's an original cannon, but not original to Fort Barrancas. What we know to have occurred was the Confederates, before they abandoned Pensacola, they took anything that could be of use to the Federals and they tried to destroy it and get rid of it. Um, it whether they could spike the cannon or dump it into the bay. This was a U.S. Army post, like I said, until 1947. The Coastal Artillery was here, it was a headquarters unit, and that might explain why it is so remarkably preserved. There was a restoration project in 1978 to preserve this. Um, they worked for about four years, but most of the energy and effort was put into the Spanish water battery to, to rebuild the facade that had cracked in a storm in the 50s, as opposed to putting the brick into Fort Barrancas. So we have the privilege and the honor of standing inside a fort that is 99% um, non-restored, 
in perfect uh, condition as what, what we would have seen if we were here in 1861. The last thing that really to talk about that is really significant of this fort is the fact that they were built by slaves who didn't have their freedom and the, the fact that they were built so well and with so much pride in that effort really speaks to the, um, to the, to the ability and the, the artist ability of those slaves. But it also speaks to um, kind of that, that question and the iron, ultimate irony is they were built by slaves um, to protect Americans' liberty when these men didn't have liberty themselves. Um, I could not imagine, and I really have, have tried to push this with the visitors so they can get an understanding of it. Um, I could not imagine being here 12 hour days putting your life in here after starting over at Fort Pickens and then maybe finishing your career as a laborer, as a slave here in the 1840s, um, getting up every day, 12 hours, working this kind of labor um, and doing it with such pride and with the, um, uh, with the obvious results that we see here today. Um, it's a testament to those men's uh, strength as well as it is to the strength of the fort. Um, it's a national treasure. We're extremely lucky to have it. Um, and, and in my opinion, it is uh, the best of all of the 42 forts that were built for the third system forts. Um, and it's my great pleasure to be able to work here and be able to present it to the Americans. Our fortifications on Pensacola Bay were critical for a couple of purposes. Um, when they first started, um, when the United States first started to really enter the stage as a, as a, as a one to assert their own defense, um, but also when the European powers started recognizing that we were a force to be reckoned with, we had to have a way to protect our, ourselves and our, our eventual destiny. Um, we learned very quickly from Fort McHenry uh, that the uh, brick fortifications or earthen fortifications can't stop the world's powerful navy. We did it against England in the War of 1812. And the United States took notice of that. Um, President Adams established the uh, Navy Live Oaks um, Reservation, particularly for the live oak tree. Uh, and then we had to have a way to preserve that and protect it along with the naval shipyard. Now, it wasn't designed to be a, um, a, a shipbuilding facility so much as it was to be a repair facility um, to keep a permanent presence of U.S. Navy ships in the Gulf of Mexico. If they were damaged in combat, we had to have the capability to repair them. And that's really what the, the crux was behind the, um, the design and the strategy of building these forts. Um, Fort Pickens, larger. Fort McRae and then Fort Brancus were all three forts individually, but they were really an interlocking system to defend the fort. Uh, and then Fort Massachusetts over on Ship Island in Mississippi was an extension of that. And then, of course, the advanced readout that we have. Every kind of way I like to tell folks is um, they ask me, hey, how did you get this job working for the Park Service? Um, and, and, it, and it's a great question because a lot of people really don't understand that it's a sense of service. Um, yeah, it's a government job and we are uniform service. Um, but we're charged with protecting our heritage as, uh, as Americans, um, the, whether it's a national battlefield or whether it's um, an, an Indian burial ground. Um, so when they, really when you put it into context, I like to tell folks, you know, we're not paid an extremely amount of money, but we are paid with smiles and with sunsets or sunrises. Um, being able to articulate uh, something that you love, like these forts, um, to somebody who ordinarily would never have any type of exposure to something this majest, you know, this majestic, um, and to leave them walking away with a mind-blown experience of something that was educational to them, and then they get a kind of a, a tie back down to their culture, our culture, um, as Americans and where we came from, it's very satisfying. Um, but I always like to leave them with this. It's like, you know, I'm living every little boy's dream. I have the keys to a Civil War fort. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Um, there's this repository of, of, of knowledge it's, that's not sitting idle in a library somewhere or where people have to go get it. It's living, it's, it's interactive, and it's present. Um, I think the best value of the Park Service is no matter what monument has been established, it was established for a historical purpose that was important to the culture of the United States uh, and our history. And having individuals that are living and breathing that a member of the public can come up to and say, tell me about this, why is this important to me, um, it's invaluable. That's what makes this 170 year old fort just as valuable today and just as important to America as it was when it was built in 1844. These forts became part of the newly formed Gulf Islands National Seashore in 1971. Their brick and mortar stand in stark contrast to the natural beauty that surround them. It is the inclusion of these forts into a national park system that helps keep them preserved and protected. We get a lot of visitors that come to Gulf Islands National Seashore to see our beaches. When you have a resource that we have for the Gulf Islands National Seashore, um, people look at it and it's a, a lot of things to a lot of people, um, but it's kind of many things. Um, it's the shorebirds, it's the turtles, um, it's our forts. We have uh, five forts, I believe, um, in total um, that make up the Gulf Islands National Seashore. It's uh, being able to educate the public on um, the whole gamut of it. Um, 
when I started with the shorebirds, I had to approach perfect strangers on the beach and try to talk to them about birds in the middle of summer. Now you have tourists that are down here from the north. Um, they really don't want to be interrupted, uh, particularly when they're trying to enjoy the beach and get their suntan. Uh, but here I am walking on the beach and talking to them about a bird. Um, but it was a critical bird because it also educates them and lets them know, hey, why you're coming here. Um, these Gulf Islands National Seashores exist because not only for the forest, but because of the wildlife that we have here. And after about three or four days they're there, and then they start to find out there's a little bit more they can do. And then we start getting people that will show up here and see our fort, and uh, they're just blown away by it. Um, so if you're, an, if you're a Pensacolian and you live in the area and you've never been to our fort, you're not alone. So it's not too late for you. You can come to our fort. Um, it's here, it's gonna be here tomorrow. Um, it'll probably be here for another 170 years. To get to Fort Barrancas, just take Blue Angel Parkway south to the west entrance of NAS Pensacola. Go through the guard shack and continue for about three miles. The fort entrance will be on your right. We hope you've enjoyed this look at one of the most beautiful third system forts this country ever created. We'll see you again next time, right in your own backyard.